Welcome to Line Upon Line, the Q&A session that follows the weekly yeshiva at Beit Melech. And the book that's being studied at the moment is the book of James, or more accurately, the book of Yaakov. If you missed the reason for that name change, you better check out the previous episode. But we are finishing off James chapter 1 today, and Rabbi Yaakov joins me again. G'day, Yaakov. Boker Tov, Aaron, and Shalom. It's good to be with you again. We're picking up today on a verse that's actually in a few very popular Christian songs. And immediately that reminds me that so often we lift verses out of their context. And some verses can stand up to that. Uh, But here's a verse that we'd do well to get a little bit of a run up. So for those who perhaps didn't see the last episode or have forgotten what the context is, we're about to learn that Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. I almost want to burst into song, but before I do, what is the context that we need to keep in mind? So in the previous verses, we were given this warning against temptation. And that, of course, follows the former warning against, not against, but the former warning of how we respond to trials or the admonishment, rather. Then Yaakov speaks about temptation and about giving in to our own desires and that sin will follow. And then, of course, death will follow that. So that's the pretext to what we're about to look at with regard to the remainder of this chapter. We'll go a little bit slowly here because in a sense you can't even get past the first word that's used to describe God and that is Father. For for Christians, of course, that's such a familiar word that it doesn't bring about any sort of reaction in us. We've been hearing people call God Father for as long as we can remember. Uh, but of course, for the original hearers, and we again remember that this letter is written to the dispersed Jewish community, this was a kind of overly familiar word for some. Perhaps they wouldn't have enjoyed even hearing God referred to as Father. It wasn't a a word they would use very often. Kind of reminds me also that uh, I'm not immune to that feeling because I know that more recently I've had occasion to bristle when people call God Papa, which is the kind of the new way that Christians like to address him. And yet that's not so far away from Abba, Daddy in Hebrew, but even I find that overly familiar. It's a real tension, isn't it? But it's a real gift that Jesus has given the faith community this more personal, intimate way of knowing God. It is a gift. It's it's also good to recognize that um, Jews in the first century were familiar with calling God Father. One of the primary um, prayers of our faith, in fact, uses the term father. But what's really important here is that Yaakov is uniting the idea of creator of the universe with the idea of father. And so you talked about bristling in a, in a way at the familiarity of some people's use of papa or daddy. Now, it is true that that's okay, but it's also true that God remains holy. So what Yaakov is doing here is he's bringing intimacy and awe together. And so we see that. We'll probably talk about that a bit with the mention of of the fact that he's the father of lights. So he's not simply the father. He's the father of lights. And so what's happening there is he's being united as creator and father for the hearer. Well, we know that he is the one who is light, but in what sense is God the father of lights? So this is referring to the luminaries of the heavens. And in fact, one way to translate the Greek is to say that he is the father of the luminaries. And of course, that's speaking first of all, of the sun, and then, of course, of the moon, which reflects the sun, and, of course, of the many stars that are in the heavens. So really it's saying he is the creator, father of the heavens. I like this idea that this particular father, he has no shadow in him. There's a beautiful, almost cosmological picture that's painted that's lost to us in the English. When we think of these luminaries, these planets, these stars, in what way uh, do they provide a wonderful metaphor for the enduring light that is God? So 
as both a metaphor and almost in juxtaposition to the light of God, they provide us with some wonderful ideas. So as a metaphor, obviously the moon reflects the sun. Now the sun is created, God is not, God is all existing. But in a similar way as believers, we are to reflect the light of God, the all existing light of God. So that's the metaphor. The other part of what's being said here actually is exposed further in the text where it talks about God having no sense of being in between orbit. So so God is never in between orbit. He never casts shadow is really what the text goes on to say. And so we see there that God, unlike the created lights, is not subject to change. So there's some really exciting ideas going on there. Of course, part of the juxtaposition there is between God and and you and I, that we, unfortunately, are often in between orbits. We are often light one minute and casting terrible shadows the next, that we are inconsistent. But thank goodness that God is more consistent than we could ever hope to be. This next verse talks about how he has uh, given us birth through the word. There's two kind of ideas there that are worth packing, unpacking. First is this idea of us being born. Is God referring here to uh, our natural birth or the phrase that Christians don't use so much anymore, that of being born again? Yes, Yaakov is referring to being born from above. And I find that really interesting because many scholars agree, and I believe rightly so, that both John, Yohanan, and Paul, Rav Shaul, based a lot of their ideas on the book of Yaakov, that in fact, the book of Yaakov was written some 20 years before any of the other writings of the New Testament. And this idea here of being born from above is illuminated and connected further to the person of Yeshua, of Jesus, because he is, in fact, of course, the var, the word logos in, in Greek. He is the word essence substance, and his message is also the word. And so all that comes to a convergent point here. What's being said is that God birthed Messiah in us, that God birthed the word of Messiah in us, not of ourselves, but of the work of his spirit. And I think that's a very important place to begin so that we don't get confused with what Yaakov will say later about work and faith or action and faith. Talk about birth. In the Christian context, to be born again often is equated with walking forward at a meeting or putting one's hand up in a meeting and praying a prayer. Where's bang, born. But every other birth I've ever been part of, watched, learned about, took hours, took a long time. There was a process. Is birth an event or a process or is it both when it comes to that spiritual birth? Yes, it's both. And I believe that it's important for us to understand the process. It speaks into the journey of discipleship. And as you rightly point out, a birth doesn't happen in a few moments. And in fact, I think in many cases, it was certainly the case with our first daughter. The first birth usually takes a lot longer uh, than some of the later children. And when we are being born from above, this really is the first birth into the things of the Lord, even though it's our second birth relative to our physical birth. So that's a process. And then, of course, we go on to milk. And then, of course, later in the New Testament, we are admonished not to stay on milk, but to grow further. So I think pointing out the journey aspect of this process is very important. There's this phrase that comes up uh, from the Shavuot conversation, and that is this idea of being first fruits. That, that's that same phrase again, isn't it? What does it mean in this context that those who have been given this birth through the word of truth have become first fruits? In, in what sense? Is there a connection to Shavuot? Yes, 
it's fantastic that there's this great connection to Shavuot and first fruits. And isn't it neat that when we understand the fuller picture of Shavuot, Pentecost, the connection to the giving of the Torah at Sinai, then the connection to the outpouring and infilling of the Holy Spirit, and we think back to Shavuot and Shavuot in Acts 2, where all the Jews from the known world who have come up to Jerusalem are the first to receive the infilling of the War HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, very much first fruits, but it didn't stop there. Now, Yaakov is speaking specifically to Jewish believers spread throughout the known world at the time, but by inference, he is also pointing to the fact that the first fruits offering of two loaves of yeast filled bread is a symbol of two groups of people who are sin affected, but nonetheless both need the saving work of Messiah. And those two groups of people are Yodim, the Jews, the Goyim, and the Gentiles. So really, even though he's specifically writing to his Jewish brothers and sisters, he is also denoting the spread of the gospel and the first fruits of all believers of all ethnicities. This next verse, uh, I wonder if it has a bit of a context within the chapter itself that we're missing, in as much as here is a letter, most likely being read in a church meeting context to believers, and then suddenly Yaakov says, now look, I want you to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Why would the people listening to this letter be tempted to get angry at this point? I mean, that sounds like such good universal advice about being slow to, to, to speak and quick to listen and slow to be angry. But I suspect he's talking to the group, kind of anticipating they might be getting a little bit edgy now. Well, part of this, of course, uh, carries over from the fact that this letter is addressed very specifically to Jewish believers and yet it may well at times have been read in congregations that were convergent, that had both Jews and Greeks, and of course other ethnicities who were a part of these congregations. So part of the hangover of that first offense is going to be present. He has gone on to talk about things that in some cases, will be shifting people's paradigm with regard to the way they understand God and the way they understand salvation and discipleship being birthed within them of God rather than them uh, causing it to happen through their actions. This is also an offensive idea. There are a lot of things going on, and so he needs to he needs to pretext what he is about to say as well because we will get on to chapter two. But as we move on, we see more and more opportunities for taking offense. We look at chapter two and we're told, hey, so you believe. Well, even the devil believes. So he does this now, anticipating what's to come and knowing that some of what he's about to say later is going to be very offensive. Uh, perhaps the more modern rendering might say, be slow to post your reply on Facebook. Uh, we're often in this context, in this age, very tempted to shoot from the hip, to speak very quickly. So despite the fact that this verse might be preparing the audience for something, it, it rings true to our modern ears. It also rings true how difficult it is. I mean, how is it that we can practice being those who are quick to listen and slow to speak and, of course, slow to be angry? Let's face it, it's our inclination, and God called us out very early in the picture, that that their every inclination is toward Yitzir Hara, toward the evil inclination. Um, it's, it's our natural go-to to want to react, to want to win, to want to be able to refute what we don't like hearing. I think in order to practice what Yaakov is teaching here, we need to be, to be intentional and we need to be intentional long before we face a situation where we do need to be quick to hear. So um, something that I'm fond of in your own practice, Aaron, is you've um, learned to counsel others and become better and better at doing what you do. 
is that it has become your practice to intentionally listen and actively listen and then to respond rather than just to throw back an answer or a witty quip in order to win an argument. And really it is about implementing that practice, choosing when we get up in the morning to be intentional, to be active listeners and to wait and then respond rather than react. And I know that's something I I think you'd agree that's something that we need to perpetually be intentional about. It doesn't come naturally to me. And of course, the conclusion that Yaakov writes here is so obvious to us now that that human anger, it's never connected to bringing about the righteousness of God. It doesn't bring it about in us. It doesn't bring it about in others. It usually just causes more strife. This chapter does seem to kind of have this balance between the things we are doing or not doing and the things that God is doing. And that kind of comparisons right here in this next verse. On the one hand, you and I are called to get rid of the moral filth, but interestingly, we're not told to suddenly um, try harder at being good. On the other side, we have to accept the word as something that God is now doing in us. Uh, The first bit makes sense to us. We should get rid of bad stuff. But that the answer isn't that I just kind of do better at being a good boy. Uh, that's more difficult to really understand how that could bring about the right response. I think it's interesting that uh, with regard to what you're saying, a lot of English versions of the Bible translate the Greek text to read, prove yourselves to be workers of righteousness. But really what the Greek says, and my new son-in-law, my only son-in-law, was kind enough to speak about the passive tense of the Greek word used. Really what it's saying is be made doers of the word or be made performers of righteousness. And being a passive verb, what it means is receive being made. So there's this beautiful convergence of ideas where we can't work good unless the good, that is God, (laughs) works good in us. But more to the point, that doesn't practically happen unless we receive his work within us. So it's very much a reciprocal thing that's going on here. God is the one who authors the good works but we have to receive it in order to be made doers of those good works. That's not easy because it kind of feels like, well, I'm not sure what my part is anymore. I mean, it's obvious to me if I'm the one who has to be the doer, but if God is going to make me the doer, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work. And does that mean that when I fail to be a doer, somehow I'm off the hook that I can say, well, God, you just didn't make me a good enough doer yet. Where is the place of partnership in this idea beyond simply accepting and receiving truth? How does one partner with God in being transformed into a doer? And I think that comes back to this idea of intentionality and the false understanding of intentionality is that somehow I'm the originator of my intention. So that that's sort of the go-to in a a reasoned world where where logic pervades, that's the go-to. But in the kingdom view, we understand that the originator of our new intention is God himself We have just read about being born in the word, born from above. We are being born in Messiah, and it comes back to this wonderful idea that we are no longer the old man, the sin-affected man, but we are a new creation. And so when we have this sense that we need to be intentional about doing good, that sense is of the Holy Spirit in us, and we respond by acting. We're not off the hook, and it's great that you pointed that out. We are, in some ways, more accountable than we've ever been, and so we act and we respond out of that knowledge, knowing that it originates from Messiah in us and not from us going toward God. This next image is perhaps one of the most famous from the passage, the idea of looking into a mirror, 
kind of catching a glimpse of who it is you you really are, a child of God, transformed, renewed, forgiven, and then somehow turning away and forgetting and, and going back and doing stuff that doesn't belong to that new reality that you've come to embrace. There's a lot in that image for us that perhaps we're, we're missing in a more modern context. I mean, even the placement of the mirror in which we are seeing our reflection. Talk to us about the depth and the, the nuance of that image. So I love the, the Greek text here, and the Hebrew affirms it. And those of you who have been listening to Aaron and I discuss these things will know that the Hebrew is a much more modern translation of the ancient Greek. Now, the Greek text makes a very interesting distinction in the way this reflective analogy is used. We first have a mirror, and very clearly it's referring to a mirror that is either held in front of a person and or perhaps on a wall, and usually that would be viewed in an upright position of some kind. And we're told that this first person in the analogy looks walks away and forgets what he looks like. But then the text takes on an interesting nuance where it actually says in the Greek, but one who bends over stoops down to look intently into the law or the Torah perfected. Now, that's something different altogether. Many of us miss this and simply think that the mirror analogy is being continued, that looking into the Torah is still looking into the mirror, but getting some sort of different uh, reflection. That's not the case. Here, looking into the perfected Torah or the law perfected is something you have to bend over and look down into. And so straight away, this denotes something other than a mirror, which is either held in front of you or on a wall in front of you. And what it most likely denotes is a body of water, a reflective surface that sits below us. And of course, this brings up some wonderful ideas from scripture related to Maim Chaim, living water, water from a pure source. And we know that this water is of the King Messiah, Yeshua, so that the Torah or the law being referred to here is a perfected version of the Torah that emanates from Yeshua. And we need to be very careful, especially as Messianic Jews, not to automatically say that Torah always refers to the entire work of the books of Moses. That is clearly not the case here, because in this perfected sense, nothing that rejects evil will need to remain because in the world to come there'll be no sin there'll be no present evil and so all the negative commandments the thou shalt not will not be part of that perfected Torah so there's a lot going on here it seems that uh, a lot of modern believers get sort of almost polarized at this point on the one hand there are those who become sort of the the law keepers and law followers and we'll often describe them as being legalistic. And then there are those who might say, oh, the law has nothing nothing for me to worry about. And, and they perceive freedom to be a freedom from any kind of idea of how you outwork uh, your faith. And with that, of course, has come this misuse or change of use of the word religious. So we would tend to perceive perhaps those who want to follow the rules, they're the religious people. And I'm past all that rule stuff, so I'm not religious. How do we avoid these false choices? How do we avoid being drawn into either camp because they both have their problems and find this kind of middle ground that says, actually, my faith has to be lived. It can't just be believed. It has to actually express itself in the world. There's so much going on there. I'm glad you used the word, the phrase false choices. Isn't it wonderful that the person of Yeshua, Jesus, has set us free from false choices. Uh, we seem to always want to go back to them. But one of the joys of being in relationship in God is that, again, simply listening and hearing what he's got to say informs the way we respond 
and therefore we're able to act in his strength. And it really is sad that we make this false choice of, oh, I'm going to be free, completely free, and to the extent that I'm free to sin, or we make this other false choice that I'm going to observe the law, and because I observe the law so well, I'm a better believer than everyone else. When what's really being said here is your view or understanding of Torah has shifted, meaning that when you were not in relationship with God through Messiah, you saw the Torah for what it was, punitive law, accusing you. But now that you've met Yeshua, the author of the Torah, you understand it as the instruction of a loving father guiding you. And so you're less likely to resist that, knowing that the Father loves you and that something you may or may not necessarily want to do is going to birth good fruit in you. And so you tend to be more likely to want to do what's good. That is all coming from Messiah in us, rather than from us trying to earn God's approval. What has shifted in our understanding is that now that we've met Yeshua and understood that God approves of us, we live out of his approval instead of for his approval. I do love the fact now that we're thinking about this being a letter that's written. Again, we have Yaakov saying, hey, and, and just while you're getting angry now at this thought of being double-minded and all these sorts of things, uh, keep a tight rein on your tongue because uh, your religion is worthless if you if you can't do that. So again, we're reminded to get back in control of ourselves. But thankfully, Yaakov provides us with a working definition of the kind of religion that God is pleased with. And interestingly, in a culture, in our context, in, in the West, where Christians are often uh, scorned, it's also the kind of the re of religion that the world can accept in that they recognize that when we care for the widows and the orphans and their distress, that's something that they can see has merit, particularly because anytime we, we stoop to look after those who are weak or vulnerable in some way, to use our power not to advance ourselves, but to help them, that immediately is recognized as something of some value. I'm not sure the world values the second part as much, that you remain undefiled from the world. But it is curious to me that both God and the world have something in common here, that they can see a real believer by the things they do, not just the things they say they believe. Yes, and the wonderful thing about that is not only does it provide relief for the widow and the orphan. And of course, it reflects the father heart of God. Isn't it interesting that at the beginning of this portion, we see father of lights, that is the father and creator of all things. And here we see that we should reflect that father heart in being fathers to the fatherless. What a wonderful picture but also what we have here is an opportunity for the message of salvation and discipleship and eternal life. This is a mechanism. These actions of ours where we love and look after the fatherless, the widow, the orphan, these actions build bridges to others that afford us the opportunity to tell them about eternal life, about salvation and discipleship. So it's neat in fact, that there's common ground there, that even if people are mislabeling this as a humanitarian act, they are still seeing it as good. And that is a vehicle for us to speak about the one who is truly good and from whom all good things come. <laughs> 